welcome back to another episode of the nonprofit show everyone i'm really excited to be talking with our guest today because amy fast ceo and executive director of shoes that fit is going to be talking to us about flexing or die and i think given that we've been like watching the olympics what's going on how do we flex and how do we navigate forward is a big topic welcome amy oh it's so great to be here julia thanks for having me i'm really excited to chat with you um in the little bits and snippets of time that we've had together um you and i seem to have like a lot of really super odd connecting points in our life and so it's it's so interesting to me uh you were introduced to us by one of our co-hosts sherry kwam taylor and um so we're really excited to get you on and, and get you talking we're also super excited about our amazing presenting sponsors that are with us day in and day out they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader your part-time controller Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday show, all about exclusively about dedicated to fundraising every Friday, and then 180 Management Group. We have these amazing co-hosts, as I mentioned, Sherry Quam Taylor, um, CEO of Quam Taylor, introduced us to Amy Foss, and so super cool uh, folks that come from all over the country, super uh, diverse in what they do, and. Um, I'm sure you've enjoyed meeting them as I've enjoyed working with them. But more importantly, Amy Foss, executive director of Shoes That Fit and the author of The Business of Nonprofiting is with us today. Welcome, 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 Amy. Well, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. So let's start with what Shoes That Fit, what your, your organization that you leads, what is it that you all do? So Shoes That Fit is just a very concrete um, attempt to address one of the most visible signs of poverty in America. We know that child poverty is very, you know, it's a huge issue and it's very complicated. But kids who don't have shoes can't go to school. They can't join sports teams. Um, they tend to hide and not feel like they belong. So we have just decided to tackle this very specific piece of the puzzle and provide brand new name brand athletic shoes. For us, this is about um, investing in kids, giving them what they see other kids around the country having, and really investing in their self-esteem. Self so we're really a school support in many ways, but trying to remove this, this basic barrier to success. You know, Amy, it's so interesting because um, when I grew up, there were like kids <laughs> and kids, right? Now and now it's like so um and i love you use the word complicated and sure. shoes are such a big part of a kid's as you said self-esteem what they can do what they can't do and um it's really an interesting thing that a new pair of shoes can change a, a, a child's life i mean just as an adult what do you yeah. feel better about you put you know you put on the same outfit but you put on a new pair of shoes and for some weird reason it imbues you with a sense of confidence or achievement and it so really interesting yeah it really does and i think for these kids who are seeing you know these shoes out there on their you know on athletes on you know that's mm -hmm. it's, it's there's something about shoes and kids that's just intrinsically linked together and it just makes them feel proud of themselves yeah well the other big thing that you do and and for me i i just can't wait to hear more about this you are the author of The Business of Non-Profiting, which I love that. Talk to us about your book, where we can find it, and give us the quick synopsis. Yeah, um, so you can find it on Amazon.com. Um, it is, I wrote it actually during the pandemic um, at a time where all of us, I think, were really struggling. And I was really coming up against some of the myths of nonprofiting and seeing some of these nonprofits really flex their muscle and get a lot done. So I decided I actually wrote this for an audience, which I don't think is the audience that read it. <laughs> I wrote it um, thinking of really business people who think that running a nonprofit is easy. I can't tell you how many people have talked to me about thinking of leaving their jobs. They'd like to go to a nonprofit and kind of be able to relax a little bit. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, 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 <laughs> you have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then for others who feel like nonprofits need to work more like businesses because we're just not really well managed. And I just thought those two things were completely ridiculous. Not that there might be places on the edges, if that's true. Right. 
but it was just so ludicrous to me. So, and interesting is I found the people reading it are people in the nonprofit world, which is not really what I was gearing it for. So it's been very interesting for me. You know, interesting for us to hear about this because the two big things that you said, I get asked about all the time. I get, you know, what we perceive is the, the valiant aspect of nonprofit leadership, nonprofit mm -hmm. work is so different than what it actually is to the outside world and what True. people think. Um, so I love this. Um, I'll confess, I haven't read your book yet, but I do have it on order. And uh, so really, really interesting that you've done this and, uh, and share your perspective. Um, well, let's get into it. When you talk about writing and you talk about leading, what are you seeing as the biggest myths about nonprofits? And I'm going to ask this in two levels, okay. internally and externally, okay. because I feel like internally, we don't understand what everybody does oftentimes, right? But externally, how do you see this playing out? Yeah, you know, Julie, that's a really good point, um, because I think the two are just so inter <laughs> you know, interrelated, um, because I think these myths kind of affect how we see ourselves and can lead to a real scarcity mindset. That's a whole nother, a whole nother topic. Um, I, I think the word nonprofit to begin with is deeply problematic. Um, it implies that you cannot make a profit. Um, and what it really means is it's just a tax status. That's all that the word, um, it's a tax status. People can donate to us and they can have a tax write-off and we don't have to pay taxes. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, which is that we don't, uh, the U.S. has more nonprofits than any other nation in the world and gives more to nonprofits than any other nation in the world. And the mm -hmm. positive side of that is it leads to passionate people with real entrepreneurial, you know, entrepreneurial passion and um, energy looking at the world and saying, okay, here are issues that we think that we can help, we can address. The negative side of that is there really isn't a safety net in the U.S. because government has kind of deferred that to these entrepreneurs. So it means that we have kind of a patchwork system. But really nonprofit um, is, is purely a tax status and you can't operate a nonprofit without making a profit. I can't employ people if I'm spending out every penny every year. I'm running a business. I'm actually running two businesses. I have a mission to reach the children that can't speak, you know, cannot address this issue themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. But I'm running a second business, which is fundraising, to right. pay for that. So we are right. some of the most interesting, I think, businesses around because we're mission focused, mm -hmm. and we have to convince a complete. We don't have to convince our the people we're serving. We have to convince an uninterested audience to pay for it. So I think you see some of the best management in a well-run nonprofit that mm -hmm. you that you see out there. I love that you said that, and I'm going to use the S word, which is kind of a dirty word in the nonprofit sector, but sales. I think yeah. some of the best salespeople are in the nonprofit sector because there's nothing really transactional. You're not going to get a no. new sofa or a diamond ring by making this contribution, you know, making the sale. And so you have to really tap dance through the fires of hell to make a connection that somebody says, yes, I will invest with you. I will, you know, give you money um, for nothing than a good feeling. Well, and you're people. talking to them at a deeper level. So yes. you're asking your donors what really matters to them and yes. what they value. So it's a very deep conversation. Yeah. Um, I, I think another myth um, is just this whole low overhead means that you're better run. Um, I understand there can be abuses in nonprofits. So I'm not saying there shouldn't be, you know, any oversight, but you don't want to look at overhead. You want to look at impact. You want to right. look at what the organization is accomplishing. Are they making a difference? Is it worth your investment in it? And I think looking at overhead just keeps us in this very scarcity mindset mm -hmm. rather than being able to invest so that we can make more of an impact. Um, th those are some of my. I, you know, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> those are the things you're thinking about. Um, yeah. You know, before we move on, I, I, I'm dying to ask this, this question as a follow up. And that is, how incumbent is it upon us in the nonprofit sector to be explaining this or educating or highlighting these myths to our donors or in conversation that we have with potential donor investors and funders? 
Um, I think it's a very sensitive issue because you never yeah. want to start out in a combative way and say, no, you're wrong. But I do think it's incumbent on us actually to, number one, understand it, to mm. understand the part of the system that we are working in and to really be excruciating clear about our mission. I think if you focus on that, then when things come up, you can just redirect the conversation. Um, I would never take a donor and say, oh, overhead doesn't matter, because that's not going to get us anywhere. But if you can focus them on the mission, how you're accomplishing the mission, what you need to accomplish the mission, what the people are doing, what sources mm -hmm. you're unleashing by their donation, I think you can kind of move them. Mm -hmm. Within the sector, I think it's really important to talk about. So what we talk about within mm -hmm. the sector and with donors, I think we have to be a little careful. But yeah, we have, we have to change this mindset in a way that's really realistic. I'm not just saying anything goes. But I think mm -hmm. we have to be able to ground it in what is really happening um, in the mm -hmm. world that we're working in. Yeah, Amy, I love this. I think you're you're spot on about this, and I and I love that um, you know navigating the conversation towards impact. I think a lot of folks don't even really understand what that means, right? And how mm -hmm. if we can kind of highlight what we as nonprofits are right. are looking for and what does impact mean to us it means something different you know, depending on the organization, but really having that conversation is super important. Okay. Now I'm going to suck all the air out of the room oh no. and, oh no. <laughs> and talk about the role of nonprofit boards term in terms of being flexible or dying. What does that look like? I think this is the most complicated part of running a nonprofit. Um, and I've been on both sides of the aisle. I've chaired boards. I've served on boards. Um, so I, I've seen it from both sides. It, it's just intrinsically odd. It's just a little weird that the board <laughs> hires the executive director, but the executive director leads the board. So there's always this question of who's in charge. And I think uh, the executive director needs to really firmly realize that they are, they are in charge. They report to the board as a whole. They do not report to the board chair. They don't report to the executive committee, it's to the board as, as a whole. But you really have to educate the board on what their role is because most board members don't have experience in that. So I think those conversations um, and having some training coming in and having you see how you can really work together again to accomplish this mission, always keeping it at a high level. I just know um, the most excruciating death of an executive director is when you get crosswise with your board. I mean, once that happens, they have lost confidence in you and you're leading them. So I think it's something you have to get ahead of. You have to be very vocal about um, where you see the organization going, how the board can support. I think there are times you have to clarify the role of the board, whether it's mm -hmm. the um, staff and ED, uh, the fact that the executive director reports to the board, not the staff. Mm -hmm. The executive director has authority over the staff and you can't let those lines get crossed. It's, um, I, I would say the most important thing to do is get training yourself and then bring your board members in on that so you can have a conversation about it. I, I feel like Shoes at Fit has over 10 years built a really healthy board, but it's because we have done a lot of training together and, yeah. and been very explicit about how we can support each other. Right. And, you know, so I couldn't agree with you more. I think this is a, a missing piece for so many organizations. Uh -huh. And I hear all the time, oh, my God, our, I, you know, I've been on this board and it works great. And then I, I'm on that board and it's horrible. And I think that the biggest piece for me, and I'm really interested in hearing your, your comment on this, is communication. Because yeah. the training aspect is not a one and done. No, not at all. Training should just be opening the door to communication so you have a common language that you can yeah. talk about. But it's always involving. And, of course, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. If board members don't know what they are supposed to be doing, what you need them to be doing, what their role is, they're going to find something else to do. So you have to be, you know, not not telling them what to do, but together mm -hmm. discussing what the role of the board is, what the organization needs from the board. And it, it's constantly evolving. Um, my board members are now opening doors for us that I didn't think we could open, but it took us a long time to get to that place. Right. And do you think that they are happier board members, that they're more excited about your organization and um, being, you know, um, more engaged with you because of oh, this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, have them on. Actually, I'd love you to have my, my board members on and they because they are doing something and they're doing yeah. things that I can't do, that the staff can't do. They are opening doors, you know, mm -hmm. access 
for us. They love doing that. They want to make a difference. I, I truly believe most people want to make a difference. Um, so agree. you're giving them an opportunity, but you have to know what you need from them. Um, and you have to discuss it with them because maybe what you think you need isn't possible. But it has to be this ongoing conversation with the assumption that we're all rowing in the same direction. But if you're not completely clear on your mission, you can't do that. So I, I just think nonprofit management, you have to be so clear on your mission that you really, you're reviewing it periodically, just making sure that you know exactly why you're doing what you're doing. Right, right. I think too, you know, we get caught up in so much of the emotional aspects of what a nonprofit does, what the sector does. Um, there's just a whole level of emotional aspects and responses. So I really appreciate you saying, move back to that clarity point and uh -huh. saying, you know, this is this is the job that we need to get done. Um, because this is a really important aspect to get everybody working um, and not just fighting fires. You know, right. this board member is doing that. And, and I, I absolutely agree with you wholeheartedly. And it's an interesting thing because when you do see nonprofits that are flexing that and, and going back to that, they do so much better. Um, mm -hmm. And again, as we were just saying, it's not a one and done. Yeah. When you're looking at board training with different organizations, your own, throughout your community, what does that look like? I mean, can you give us kind of a feel for what you've seen has been successful? We've had all sorts of different board training. I mean, we do a board retreat every year. I just think it's important, especially with so many things being on Zoom, for us to come together in person. And I like bringing an external facilitator in um, because I think, well, actually, it, it takes the burden off me. So I can sit back and kind of watch what's going on. So selfishly, sure. I find it helpful. But it's also good to bring some kind of fresh energy and mm -hmm. questions and insight. And I think the board feels more comfortable sometimes. Mm -hmm. just throwing things out there, feeling like they're not questioning mm -hmm. me, but they're just ideating. We have done everything from, well, Sherry did a, a training for us on development, mm -hmm. where we could really talk about uh, expanding our vision for what we could be doing. We've done Lego Serious Play, which um, has really helped when we've talked about our strategy and where we want to go from, from here. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's really helpful to bring somebody in from the outside. Um, and usually I start by looking at what do I think the board's needs are? You know, where are we weak? Um, where are we strong? But what do we need to, to bring up? So, and to me, really, it's an opportunity to be together for a day and ideate and just kind of reground ourselves and ideate. Mm -hmm. And you can do that internally. You don't need somebody from the outside. I just really like bringing somebody in to lead it. But then we spend a couple months preparing for it to make sure that whoever that is is coming in understands where we're going. Right, exactly, and what your needs are and, and frustrations and successes. Right. Um, let's get on to our last big discussion point of our time today, and that is how is nonprofit fundraising misunderstood? And I'm gonna go back to that first conversation that we had, mm -hmm. because I believe this is internal and yep. external. And so let's start with the, the way that, since we've just been talking about the board, how have you seen boards think about fundraising and where have some of those misalignments occurred? Well, I'm gonna take what you said even one step further. I think the misunderstanding is more internal than it is external. Well, I okay. think we put ceilings on ourselves. I think sometimes even staff feel like, we're begging, we're, you know, yep. not having, and I actually think sometimes wow. board members can get it better because they're used to in their own businesses thinking big. And it's really about, um, not thinking unrealistically, but saying, you know, this is really what it would cost to fund this need. If we really wanted to solve this issue, let's, you know, I can't get there from here, but let's move back. Mm -hmm. So if I can't get to the 10 million I need to fund this issue this year, um, how do I get to 5 million? How do I get to 2 million? What is it that I need? And thinking about solving the issue and not just, ooh, how can I fund my budget this year? I think that's the big shift is where do we need to go? That doesn't mean you budget to solve the issue that year, but maybe you make a five or 10 year plan where you are thinking, okay, to really make the impact we wanna make, this is where we need to be. What do we need to get there? And getting everybody talking at a high level, because there's money out there. There's money out there. We have more than enough money in this country. But people only want to fund it if they understand why you're doing what you're doing. And they have the aha moment of, oh my gosh, here's how the world would look if we did this. Um, so I, I actually think the pressure is more internal. 
than from the outside. You know, Amy, I'm fascinated by that. And I think you are right. It's a, it's a self-esteem issue. It's a sense of where we are. And, and I think what you just said is pretty magical. And that is, what is it that we need to solve the problem and achieve mission versus keep the bean counters happy and just fill the budget? Yep. I mean, and, that, and you do have to keep the bean counter happy and fill the budget. I mean, you do, and that's what I'm saying. You're doing both. You yeah, are yeah. doing both. You're running a business but you're also running this fundraising. Yeah, yeah. One of the first, my background is in fundraising and higher education. And one of the first things I learned in that very early on, you learn a lot through mistakes, is you have to see yourself eye to eye with the person you're talking with, regardless of what's going on in your life. But as a human being, you are having an equal conversation. And if you can't get there, you're always going to be in that one down position. You have to realize, okay, this person may have more money, but I have more experience. And we're going to talk about how we can wed these two things. So I do think, as you say, self-esteem has a lot to do with it. It's an amazing thing. Okay, so we think about these, this like structure and this ecosystem of fundraising internally. Now let's go to the outside and and let's talk about how people think about fundraising and what your experiences have been, especially when we think about flex or die. I mean, how can we navigate this in a way? that's going to put us forward, make us whole, and make us more fit, effective? I think a lot of it goes back to planning. And one of my very favorite articles ever is, um, it was by Stanford Social Innovation Research, but it was mm -hmm. strategic planning is dead, long live planning. And I just, I thought that was just such a brilliant, very, very short article, but a brilliant article that talked about, you know, so much of strategic plan planning is looking at the back. You, know, you look behind you and you mm -hmm. look at the past as, a predictor of success and it's kind of a stagnant world. We live in an incredibly turbulent world. Things are yeah. changing hourly sometimes. People's mm -hmm. opinions and attitudes yeah. of things are changing. I think it's a constant feedback loop. So you're going to get feedback from your donors, from foundations. Um, they're going to tell you what isn't working with them in their mind. And you have to take that in. And I tend to look at it as a communication issue often because I feel really grounded in what we're trying to do. And I don't I don't see a lot of pushback to what we're trying to do, but what is it about how I'm communicating that that is not landing, that is not advancing the cause? Um, so I, I think there's a lot of communication. A, a lot of fundraising, I think, is testing. Does this yep. work? Does that not work? You have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing right. to try things and say, because my audience is different than other audiences. I, I know that. There are people who love what way they do. They tend to love vulnerable communities and animals. We have learned that. They love children and animals. You talk to them in a certain way, but even within that, I'm going to talk to a CEO of a company very differently than I'm talking to somebody who's just running their, well, I shouldn't say just, but is running a family giving circle. I, you know, they have, you have to yeah. hear what their values are and what they are looking to do because they want to do something with their money. And then you find, you know, the sweet spot. But I do think as fundraisers, we have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to have an ask and, and have it be no or not now, which is actually more often what happens. Um, but if you're not doing that, you're not thinking big enough. Right, right. You know, um, learning to fail and learning to manage failure, I think is like a magical touchstone in a life, right? Because as fundraisers and, and community leaders, if you went out and you couldn't navigate past a no, yeah. or a disappointment, um, your community stagnates, right? Because yeah. you, you lose that that energy. And, and, you know, to follow the theme here, if you're not flexible enough and you just retreat, then everyone loses. Everyone yeah. loses. Well, or if you take that, know what, it makes you feel smaller. You never yeah. get a big ask because you're like, oh, I can't get there. I have to prepare. So yeah. all of these things are a fine balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think we need to think bigger than we tend to think. Yeah. Yeah. I liked what really what you said, too, is, um, you know, the fearlessness of it, because I think a lot of times in the nonprofit world, we work with fearless people and that they have to navigate through a crisis or their fear. They have to be brave enough to ask for help yeah. or to engage with help or engage with us with a structure mm -hmm. that they're unfamiliar with or that's frightening. And uh, to learn those lessons is pretty pretty powerful, but somehow we, we, it's a disconnect a lot of times. Yeah, I was 
just at this program at, at Harvard with these amazing nonprofit leaders from around the world. But one of the things we talked about a lot was proximity. Mm. You really need to have some proximity to the mm. cause. Yeah, um, I can come in many different forms, but I think I love what you said about understanding the struggles other people you know are going mm -hmm. through, the people you're trying to help. I think having that proximity and knowing who you're working with and seeing them and respecting them and just mm -hmm. wanting to come alongside in whatever little way you can um, yeah. is really important. So I, I love this concept of proximity. Yeah, I do too. I think that's brilliant, and I think that's a that's a healthy thing for everyone yeah. to remember. Um, yeah. I talk about an experience I had early on, and unfortunately, I've seen it played out years and years since, um, about boards that meet in rarefied boardrooms mm -hmm. in beautiful places and not necessarily on the campuses of where they yeah. serve. Yeah. And that is one of my big pet peeves. Um, in fact, I'm going to a site right after this meeting of an organization and they wanted to meet in some lovely place. And I was like, well, let's meet on your campus. And they're like, oh. kind of, I think they were afraid for me to see it, to be honest. And, for um, and, and I was like, yeah. hello, I can't help you or help you help yourselves if we're not in the trenches, right? Yep. If we're sitting and and I love your word, I'm just thinking about it. You know, we're oh, we're just thinking what yeah. we think is going to help. Yeah, yeah. like you got to. Yeah. You know, we we want board members to go on deliveries. We want them to go on number one to see the campuses that we're on. And there's just this divide. We're in gated communities to see these kids. These are and see the teachers. There are some amazing teachers out there, and I just mm -hmm. think bringing those together. You can't do planning without really understanding what you're yeah. trying to do. Yeah, proximity, the word of the day. Um, Amy Foss, this has been great. I could speak to you. Oh my gosh, I could like be speaking to you every day on the nonprofit show because you're you're speaking my language and you're I love what you've um you know what you've learned and, and how you're championing this. Amy's written a book, The Business of Nonprofiting, The Journey and Perspective on Nonprofiting really an important discussion and this could be one of those things that it's a great purchase for your board and and kind of use it as like um a book club situation where you get everybody um the book and then have them read a certain number of chapters and then and then discuss it because um i think this is one of those those touchstone points of of discussion and, and intellectual pursuit sometimes amy i find we need these things so that we get away from the emotion and we get back to the intellectual aspect of what we're doing. And that's how you let us off on this discussion yeah. so brilliantly today. And doesn't that kind of ground our emotion sometimes? And sometimes yeah. when you feel like you're having that, oh, to yeah. think about why. Right. I love it. I think Thank it's you. genius. Well, Amy Fass, CEO, Executive Director, Shoes That Fit. Check out um, Amy's work and her leadership in the nonprofit sector. Super, super important. Amy, this has been a great conversation. Um, I, I, I know I feel more flexible and, and more maybe <laughs> empowered to be flexible, right? Empowered. Like or die. That it has been my motto in life. Flex yeah. or die. Yeah, I think it's really a really cool way to look at this. And I think it's um, especially in our nonprofit sector as we're moving into this tenuous time of Q4 general election fear about our donors going to be working with us and investing with us. Um, this is a, has been a really good conversation. So thank you so much for joining us on the nonprofit show. We're all in it together. Thank you. I love that. I love that. Well, hey everybody, we end every episode of the nonprofit show with our mantra and it goes like this to stay well. So you can do well. See you again. <laughs>